Thanks very much. Um, so my presentation is on understanding immobility, exploring the relationship between migration aspirations and the capacity to aspire. And I'm basically starting from the point that the vast majority of the world's population do not migrate. And yet migration studies tends to focus exclusively on the determinants and the outcomes of mobility. But I want to argue that grappling with the question of immobility is crucial to efforts to reconceptualize migration as an intrinsic part of broader processes of social change. I'll proceed with this task by first reviewing and evaluating the explanations for why people do not migrate, distinguishing between the aspiration and the ability to do so. Then I consider one explanation in particular depth, the notion that those who do not aspire to migrate may lack the capacity to aspire. The concept of a capacity to aspire is emerging in conversations in both migration and development studies, and it is often identified with aspirations for greater wealth. I challenge the potential conflation of migration aspirations with the capacity to aspire by showing that the capacity to aspire may find expression in non-material values and in the aspiration to stay. And if I'm not over time, I'll draw on a few uh, anecdotes from the Imagine Project in Senegal to illustrate some of the issues at stake. So to first clarify my terms, I do not wish to make a strict divide between those who migrate and those who don't migrate. I remember last year at a conference, uh, the Dimmick conference here, someone had asked Ronald Skeldon, why do people not move? And he responded, everyone moves, some just further than others. And I would agree with this point. Um, and I think looking at migration brings a lot of conceptual challenges. And uh, some of the earliest scholarship was really on internal migration, even residential migration. Now we focus more on international migration. And I would argue that just as migration can look many ways and we have to decide how we're going to measure and look at it, the same is true for immobility. Mobility and immobility can be studied in relation to a respective frame, whether it's residential, internal, or international. A lot of the research I'm drawing on for this presentation is looking at non-migration from an international perspective, but I think the insights can apply to different scales. Another challenge to understanding immobility is the simple fact that asking why do people do X seems more approachable than asking why do they not do X. Um, is staying a matter of choice? Is it just a matter of inertia? Agency is often conflated with action, but to, to not move, especially when one could move, may also be a manifestation of agency. So how do we disentangle what is happening when people don't move? International migration figures suggest that 97%, roughly, do not leave their country of origin. And internal figures vary tremendously. But regardless of the actual figure, to the best of our knowledge, the majority of the world's population does not migrate internally or internationally. And given inequalities in wealth and opportunity, this may strike many as surprising. Existing migration theories generally are inadequate to explain or predict migration patterns of staying, or patterns of staying, not migration. In fact, they tend to overestimate migration from poorer to richer countries. Understandably, most migration theories are focusing on why migration occurs, whether this is wage gaps or the intrinsic demand for urban or immigrant labor in modern economies, or whether it's the displacement effects of migration. Feliz covered some of these uh, reasons that we find in migration theory. But almost all migration theories tend to predict large movements of labor migrants in response to social transformation. Explanations for immobility are generally indirect, or they're vague at best. Non-migration is more often implicitly there as an assumed starting or end point. As Oliver Bakewell has noted, a sedentary bias in migration studies assumes that non-movement is the natural state from which external forces uproot people. And as Zelensky once said, shake them loose from the countryside. Gunvor Johnson has noted that portraying immobility as the natural state means that non-migration is rarely treated as something to be explained or scrutinized. There are, however, two theoretical innovations in migration theory that attempt to explain immobility outcomes more directly. And the first is Stark's New Economics of Labor Migration which suggests that in the face of market failures, insurance constraints, households may decide to have one member migrate to diversify income and risk. And by looking at the household rather than the individual, we can often see that mobility and immobility are part of the same strategy. One may even enable the other. 
That being recognized, not all forms of immobility are part of a broader household livelihood strategy that entails migration. So, a second explanation, as proposed by Jürgen Carling, is this concept of involuntary immobility. So a recent Gallup poll found that 700 million, or 16% of the world's population, desire to migrate permanently. A striking figure considering that only 3% of the world's population actually does. So many migration theories assume people weigh the costs and benefits, the risks and opportunities of migration, and if they decide migration is better, they go. But what Carling found in his fieldwork in Cape Verde was that despite widespread migration aspirations, Many were unable to migrate because of a lack of resources, strong visa regime, migration controls, other structural constraints. Notions that we live in an age of migration, he suggests, need to be countered by the recognition that, as Glick, Schiller, and Salazar have argued, the regimes of mobility that structure political and economic globalization privilege the movement of some while simultaneously restricting the movement of others. So in this way, just as migration is an intrinsic part of the transformations that characterize our world today, so might some immobility outcomes be. In highlighting the reality of involuntary immobility, Carling also put forth an analytical framework that integrates mobility uh, and immobility outcomes. He argued that any analysis of migration needs to approach it as a two-step process and distinguish the aspiration from the ability to do so. This framework originally proposed three mobility categories, migration, involuntary immobility, and then voluntary immobility. Hein has added this idea of capability to the notion of ability, and I've introduced a fourth category, acquiescent immobility, and arguing that the desire to stay um, and the ability to stay is different for someone who has the capability to stay and someone who does not, and that this is an interesting and distinct category that we could look at. And I think it's important because not all those who are poor are lacking the capability to migrate necessarily desire to do so, as a lot of the sort of rational homo economicus actor of migration theory suggests that they should. So in this slide, a third explanation for immobility that remains underexplored, I think, is why do people not want to migrate? In my ma master's research, I propose that explanations for why someone would not develop the preference or the aspiration to migrate can be grouped into three categories. To counter these notions of push and pull, I suggest that we may see retaining factors, factors that repel, and additionally what may be described internal constraints on decision making. So retaining factors are those attractive conditions at home that influence the preference to stay. Repelling factors are those that deter people from aspiring to migrate. And both retaining and repelling factors can be economic, they can be non-economic, they're often intertwined. The third category refers to more nuanced influences on decision making at the level of individual psychology. And there's sort of a distinct literature on this. And it generally explains the preference to stay is resulting from the lack of something, of knowledge, of information, this idea of bounded rationality, they may be more risk averse as Joanna highlighted in one of her topics, I mean presentations, and also what I want to focus on is this idea that they may have an underdeveloped capacity to aspire. So I'm just going to zoom in on with this one explanation in particular, that people do not wish to migrate because they lack the capacity to aspire. In an earlier literature, this has been around for some time, there's this idea that migrants had a greater achievement motivation. And in recent literature, it's sort of translated into this idea of the capacity to aspire. So to give an example, I don't know if Matthias is here. Uh, Chaika and Vatnik, they wrote a paper in 2014, and they concluded that even when accounting for factors uh, such as age, socioeconomic background, education, they were looking at Indonesian internal migrants, and they found that they showed a unique individual predisposition for higher aspirations, and that this distinguished them from their non-migrant counterparts. They take a slightly different take on the aspiration ability framework, and they propose that the capability for migration may be seen as a combination of two individual-specific capacities, the capacity to aspire and the capacity to realize. Hein de Haas has also looked at this in his uh, working paper, Looking at Migration Theory. Uh, with IMI. He explores the conceptual difficulties really in understanding this category of acquiescent immobility. 
He says, how can we categorize a person living in poverty who does not have migration aspirations, but neither have they ever imagined being able to migrate? To what extent can we call this form of immobility voluntary? This person is not capable of moving, but also does not aspire to do so. Based on the idea that capabilities affect aspirations, we may perhaps say that the person is deprived of the capability to aspire, as well as the capability to move. So these emerging perspectives on the capacity to aspire suggest that it goes hand in hand with migration aspirations. One may be indicative of the other. I would like to argue that it's important not to conflate the two concepts, as the capacity to aspire may also find expression in the aspiration to stay. So I want to look a bit more at this concept of the capacity to aspire, where it came from, and how it's being used in the broader literature. Arjuna Padarai introduced this concept as a cultural capacity, which enables one to envision, plan, navigate, and achieve a better future. He describes it, he says, it is in culture that ideas of the future, as much as those about the past, are embedded and nurtured. Thus, in strengthening the capacity to aspire, conceived as a cultural capacity, especially among the poor, the future-oriented logic of development could find a natural ally, and the poor could find the resources required to contest and alter the conditions of their own poverty. Apatari argues that the capacity to aspire requires strengthening among poor communities and should be mobilized to enable groups of poor people to exercise voice. Voice refers to Albert Hirschman's exit voice and loyalty framework, which analyzes how people respond to situations of discontent. Applied to the case of migration, exit represents leaving one's homeland. Voice implies staying and, and trying to work for change there. Uh, and he says, in a way, his central question in Hirschman's terms would be, how can we strengthen the capability of the poor to have and to cultivate voice? So Padre suggests that exit is not a desirable response to discontent for all of the world's poor. And he really focuses on the political implications of developing the capacity to aspire among them. The development literature, however, has looked more at the relationship between aspirations and economic behavior. Confronted with the seeming failure of structural interventions to bring about meaningful change, an examination of poor people's aspirations and decision-making processes is now being explored as a missing link. Uh, the World Development Report from 2015 says that poverty can blunt the capacity to aspire and to take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves. Another summary of Apatari argues, culture is a dialogue between aspirations and sedimented traditions. Traditions linked to issues of social class can conflict with development goals. Policymakers must approach the creation of a culture of aspiration through capacity building. And aspirations are really now in vogue in development studies. In 2014, the World Bank held a conference on aspirations, poverty, and inequality. As Debraj Ray emphasized at this conference, getting aspirations right is important. Too low and people will not take action, too high and it might, it might lead to frustration. But how development interventions plan to shape people's aspirations and to what end is a question that demands careful and critical reflection. Obviously, aspirations matter when approaching questions of poverty, human development, or migration. But what are the underlying assumptions and ideologies that animate this development discourse? The use of this concept in the development field can resonate uncomfortably, I think, with early modernization thought that did not put the expansion of people's well-being at the center, but economic growth. Development was assessed in terms of income, and this was the end goal towards which aspirations should be shaped. It was often assumed in early development thought that people stuck in traditional ways of thinking would have to be taught to put economic choices first. For example, in Risto's Five Stages of Economic Growth, the takeoff stage required a change in attitudes and culture, an embracing of market rationality, and new ranges of consumption, the emergence of enterprising men. Or in a paper in 1971 by Corton and Corton, and they argue that economic development is not in, in itself the answer. Instead, the focus of development should be on the possibilities for changing individual psychological orientations in ways that will facilitate both economic and social development. Though criticisms abound of such thinking, there's reason to remain cautious of a similar framing of aspirations in the development discourse today, especially as some development interventions are explicitly focused now on shaping the aspirations of poor populations. I want to look at one paper 
in particular, this 2014 paper entitled Poverty and Aspirations Failure. Aspirations here are measured by an individual's goal for their final levels of wealth. I want to emphasize that I think this is an important aspect of aspirations to look at, but what I'm uncomfortable with is linking this to a quite normative concept of the capacity to aspire. And the way people are judged is having the capacity to aspire based on this narrow criteria of what constitutes higher aspirations, namely whether they imagine they'll be richer in the future or not. This was also the same criteria used to measure aspirations in Cheka and Vatnek's paper. The survey question read, please imagine a six-step ladder where the bottom, the first step stand the poorest people, and on the highest step stand the richest people. On which step are you today? And on which step do you expect to find yourself one or five years from now? <coughs> um, to be fair to them, they did define aspiration gaps as the motivation to achieve personal economic progress, but they also see this as a, re and they say that this is a result of conscious or unconscious desires to increase more general subjective well-being. And I do think that it is fascinating to discover that those with higher income aspirations are more likely to uh, aspire to migrate and to actually migrate. I would only ask what other aspirations may exist and how they relate to the capacity to aspire so that we don't conflate the capacity to aspire with the aspiration to migrate. A pattern I introduced this concept to suggest that as the capacity to aspire develops, so too does the capacity to exercise voice. And I'd like to suggest that if we only analyze the capacity to aspire in contexts where we try to explain exit, uh, our lens becomes too narrow, and we can reduce the applicability of the concept. So looking at non-migration uh, alongside uh, migration can help us see these other ways in which this concept and this capacity is expressed, particularly how the capacity to aspire relates to other broader life aspirations. So to summarize, I would like to add to a patterized conceptualization that the capacity to aspire can find expression through exit, which I think Chaika and Botnik have highlighted, but likewise it can also find expression through voice. So I want to briefly close by looking at uh, Okay, um, a few anecdotal quotations from a working paper. I analyzed interview transcripts from the Umagin project that explored migration aspirations among Senegalese young adults. And many have argued that a culture of migration has taken root across Senegal, and uh, the Umagin survey found that indeed only 28% of the 2,000 respondents across four regions in the country had express, expressed the preference to stay there. And as one informant noted, he said the people here only have one aspiration, which is to go to France. People here believe that the only chance for them to succeed in life is to leave the country. It has become an obsession. So in this context, I look particularly at those who do not aspire to migrate, and many of their motivations for staying were indeed non-economic. The first and perhaps most obvious one is family and community ties. One woman said, if you are abroad, even if you have a lot of money, you do not have peace of mind, and you're deprived of many things like the love of your children and your loved ones. But if you stay in the country, you'll not have such problems. For me, to stay at home is better. But it was not only women who were saying this. Another man said, there are advantages as there are disadvantages in migration. Concerning the financial benefits, it is considerable. But this is not enough, because an immigrant cannot instill some of his values in his children. They cannot educate their children. Another one that emerged was religious values. People say that over there, people do not pray at work. You can stay a whole day without prayer. This is not good for a Muslim, even if you earn billions. Another man expressed a love of Senegal. When you see how the people live over there, you realize the value of your country. You tell yourself that even if your country is not developed, at least there is a zest for life. And to me, this is the basis of life. And finally, I wanted to explore this idea of voice a little bit and whether this was seen. As one young man said, if I had the cost of a ticket, I would invest it here because it said that if you immigrate, it's because where you came from is not good. I prefer to stay and work in my country for its development. How do you understand that people leave the country to immigrate? They think that it's better over there, but according to me, if everyone stays and works, the country will progress. Another one said, in university, like in other things, there are the people who only want to succeed abroad. My philosophy is that I'm Senegalese. I want to succeed in Senegal and help my parents here. This is what my uncle did. He studied and succeeded here, and I want to follow in his footsteps. These anecdotes simply highlight that there are many non-economic factors that influence immobility outcomes. Higher aspirations are not necessarily economic ones. 
Furthermore, particularly in cases where migration aspirations are widespread, and migration is a normalized livelihood strategy, like in many regions of Senegal, it may take a greater capacity to aspire, to imagine, and to work for a future where one is. Such instances may require accepting lower incomes than one could achieve elsewhere for the sake of another aspiration. Thank you.